The stars are bright and big at night, deep in the heart of Texas. While professional wrestling has always been a big deal in the Lone Star State, there's one promotion, one city, and one family that brought the entire industry to new heights. And while there have been many a tear shed during its time, it's their triumphs that ring truer than anything else. As we're about to find out, because this is the history of world class championship wrestling. A big thank you to Baba Yaga and Jeremy P, and to all of my Patreon supporters, as your help really does make all the difference. The history of WCCW all starts with that of a single building right in the middle of Dallas, Texas. But even though we're talking about Dallas, we also have to begin by talking about Houston. After World War I, Houston became one of the biggest wrestling scenes there ever was. Now, I don't have time to get into all of it because this video is about the history of world class and Houston wrestling can get a video all onto itself. But for today, just know that after the formation of the National Wrestling Alliance, Houston under promoter Paul Bosch was considered a wrestling capital for the entire state, with tons of talent flocking to the territory just to work there. But of course, Dallas is another major Texas city, and they weren't going to be playing second fiddle to Houston forever, with the Dallas Sportatorium being built in the 1930s, serving as the venue for pro wrestling for the city. And their first wrestling event was held there on December 9, 1935. Five years later, and the arena's concession manager, Ed McLemore, would buy it out. And these beginning years were pretty rough, as the building had to survive a massive flood, which it did. But then, outrageously, in 1953, the building was partially destroyed, with William Theodore Moncrief and Roy Tatum attempting to burn the arena to the ground, and in part, they succeeded. Now, allegedly, this was all conspired by a rival wrestling promoter, and that really does sum it all up, as rivalries is what was at the very foundation of WCCW and would continue to make up the company going forward, in some ways more so than anywhere else, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. Now, this act of arson turned out to be a blessing in disguise, seeing that the facility was rebuilt later that year even better than it was before, but now it was known as the Million Dollar Sportatorium. Then in 1966, everything would begin falling into place. Jack Atkinson, better known as Fritz von Erich, would turn babyface in the ring and would partner up with McLemore behind the scenes to form a brand new promotion called Big Time Wrestling. And it was from here that Fritz and McLemore would break away from the Houston wrestling office to finally give Dallas a chance to stand on its own. Although this did not lessen either city, as both Dallas and Houston would thrive amazingly in professional wrestling going forward. It's almost like the competition made both promotions stronger. This continued to attract talent from all over. Johnny Valentine, Bruiser Brody, Wahoo McDaniel, and many, many more all came to work for the territory, as a working relationship was established with Gene LaBelle's Los Angeles promotion that kept a fresh supply of big names for big time wrestling and vice versa. Although the company would of course center around its main star, Fritz Von Erich. Fritz's first major feud as a babyface would involve him taking on Gary Hart and is stable. This rivalry would go on and off for decades and it would also introduce Fritz's sons. Then in the 1970s, it would be those same exact sons that would eventually begin to take over as the centerpiece of big time. This was all solidified when Fritz retired in 1982 after winning a match against King Kong Bundy for the NWA American Heavyweight title. Now, 1982 would be a huge year for the company. Not only did Fritz officially retire, but he also invested heavily in more modern equipment and graphics, giving the promotion a more up-to-date look. And most of all, also in 1982, the company would change names to World Class Championship Wrestling. And this, in a lot of ways, was a complete fresh start. It was now a promotion with the Von Erich boys, Kevin, David, Kerry, and eventually Mike, all as the stars, representing the new generation. And from here, things were about to go from the big time to even greater heights. On Christmas Day 1982, in Dallas's Reunion Arena, Kerry had a chance to dethrone the dastardly NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair, who had been champ for over a year at this point. Save for a few retcon title changes, but you know what? Uh, let's move on. The dirtiest player in the game had about as much heat on him as he could possibly get, having managed to cheat his way into keeping the title as long as he had, particularly against Kerry. Flair even once used corrupt 
referee Alfred Neely to help him keep the strap. But now, the young Von Erich was about to square off against Rick in a steel cage, with no disqualification, where the Nature Boy had nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And to make matters even better, the fans were given a write-in poll to decide who would be the special guest referee for this match, since they didn't want a repeat of what happened before. And they chose the good friend of the Von Erich family and the wildly popular babyface Freebird Michael Hayes, who also had his partner Freebird Terry Gordy as the ringside enforcer to guard the cage door. That's right, no shenanigans here, Flair was finally going to get what was coming to him. At least, so it seemed. Hayes got involved, interfering with the match, hitting Ric Flair, and setting Kerry up to pin him and finally take the title. But Kerry would not win the championship that way, and that's where Michael Hayes snapped. Terry Gordy would slam the cage door in Kerry Von Erich's face, and the Freebirds, the second most popular group in WCCW, had turned heel, and thus began one of the biggest rivalries that professional wrestling has ever seen. Following this, in 1983, business was good with the Freebirds vs. the Von Erichs being one of the biggest, most violent, and most successful feuds of all time. And not only that, but there were other hot angles that really kept things going. Like Buddy Roberts vs. Iceman King Parsons and Jimmy Garvin going against Chris Adams. And it was hosted by the legendary Bill Mercer. However, the following year and things would change, not for the better. Now, I've already done a video on the Von Erich family, I'll leave a link at the end of the video, so check that out for more information later on. But for now, just know that David Von Erich would leave for a trip to Japan but would never be able to return. This made front page news in Dallas, and a telecast was aired celebrating his life. Several booking decisions were made as a result of this, including Kerry finally getting to defeat Ric Flair for the NWA world title in a show held in honor of of his brother called Parade of Champions. According to Ric Flair, David would have become world champion if he had lived, and potentially a long reigning champion at that. However, as for Kerry, due to his reputation with substance abuse, the Alliance had him lose the title right back to Flair just 18 days after winning it. And then, in that same summer, the Freebirds and Jimmy Garvin would leave WCCW, and so the company would have to try and find another feud in order to carry the promotion. Although, during this time, they did manage to elevate some other stars, such as Gino Hernandez. But unfortunately, the hits would just keep on coming. By the latter part of 1985, WCCW visited Tel Aviv to great success, as they had developed quite a following there. However, during this trip, Mike Von Erich would separate his shoulder, which would lead to a case of toxic shock syndrome. And so, to remedy this, Fritz came up with a plan. At this time, the Freebirds were already making special guest appearances, but they were now ready to make their full on return. However, with only Kevin and Kerry, who were already wrestling multiple times a night, one more Von Erich was needed. And so, Fritz decided to create one. As I mentioned in that video about the Von Erich family, Fritz originally received his famous nom de plume alongside a kayfabe brother named Waldo. And all these years later, Fritz decided that this fictional sibling would have a son named Lance Von Erich, who was portrayed by William Vaughn. Although, this backfired as the Dallas audience knew that something was up which was not good for the whole babyface image. Fritz would later double clutch and retcon Lance as kin on air. Then, in the beginning of 1986, Gino Hernandez would be discovered in his apartment by local authorities and his friends, giving WCCW one less major star. And to add to that, the NWA would announce that their world champion would not be wrestling in Texas anymore. As a result, WCCW withdrew from the National Wrestling Alliance and rebranded themselves yet again this time as the World Class Wrestling Association, although they did continue to use the WCCW name for their television broadcasts. But one benefit that did come about was that the company's top prize, the WCCW American Heavyweight Championship, which was previously the NWA American Heavyweight Championship, had now become the WCWA World Heavyweight title. But more than just this, the times, they are a-changing. Because now, the WWF was in full swing, and the entire industry was evolving. 
with multiple major territories leaving the alliance and Vince McMahon looking to create a national wrestling promotion and cable television making that more possible than ever, the scope of the industry had to become bigger. But Fritz really didn't want to book shows outside of the Dallas area at the time, which led to the split between him and the company's then head booker Ken Mantell, who would leave WCWA to join Mid-South Wrestling, which had just been renamed the Universal Wrestling Federation. Following this, and business began to drop off significantly for the WCWA, allowing for other personnel outside of Mantell to be poached away to join the UWF. Parsons, Chris Adams, and even the Freebirds, among others, all left to go to Universal by December of 1986, with Adams, who was now a major star for promotion, leaving after a misdemeanor assault conviction. On top of it all, the Von Erichs' hardships were beginning to get harder to cover up, with addiction and no-showing events eroding the clean babyface image that the remaining brothers had. Not only that, but Kerry would also get into a severe motorcycle accident in June of 86, which, rumor has it, caused him to lose a foot. Now, I didn't bring this up last time because it's never been 100% publicly confirmed, especially considering all the links that were taken in order to cover it up but there are those out there who swear that it's true, so it at least warrants a mention, even though there is no evidence for it. I guess we'll never really know. Anyway, from here, business began to drop hard, with the Sportatorium shows declining by over 3,000 tickets in just six months. Then, in 1987, Mike was found overdose, and the Parade of Champions show was renamed to honor both David and Mike. However, that event normally saw around 20,000 in attendance, but now only had around 6,000. Live attendance numbers just kept on dropping. And while the UWF was already overtaking the WCWA by the middle of 1980s, Crockett would buy it out. This led to Ken Mantell starting Wild West Wrestling in nearby Fort Worth, with its star, the former Lance Von Erich, now going by the name of the fabulous Lance, who had already left World Class due to a money dispute. Multiple other talents would go to Wild West too, but eventually Mantell would agree to co-promote in World Class, and as such, Wild West was absorbed, bringing back all of the talents that had just left. Except for Lance, which really comes as no surprise to anyone. Then, as the UWF became even more of a part of the NWA following Crockett's purchase, some wrestlers like Chris Adams would also return. This led to several attempts to reignite old feuds and get the business back up and running again. But this was just holding off the inevitable. In an effort to save the Dallas wrestling scene, an attempt was made to take a world-class national with the Von Erichs Over America tour. This unfortunately did not pan out, and instead, another solution was presented when the WCWA decided to join forces with the CWA and the AWA in 1988, and this would form the infamous Pro Wrestling USA, which, as I previously covered, was a total disaster, with Kerry Von Erich losing the WCWA world title to Jerry Lawler in a unification match. The belt itself would eventually be deactivated in 1990. Following this, Ken Mantell and Fritz Von Erich would sell WCCW to Jerry Jarrett, who was the owner of the CWA, much to the dismay of Kevin. Nevertheless, with Jerry Jarrett now owning both promotions, they were renamed the USWA in 1989, thus ending the Dallas Territory as its own promotion. Meanwhile, back in Houston, Paul Bosch had already closed the Houston Territory, with Bosch opting to work with the person who would eventually buy out WCCW's syndicated tape library, Vincent Kennedy McMahon who in turn would induct the entire Von Erich family into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2009. And then, following the sale of World Class, the Sportatorium would never recoup financially, and the building would fall into disrepair, which didn't help the already outdated arena. Then, after yet another fire in December of 2001, the building was set to be demolished, which it was in 2003. And in 2018, the Oklahoma-based Imperial Wrestling Revolution would rename itself World Class Revolution in honor of WCCW and with the blessing of the entire Von Erich family. Well, there you go, the history of WCCW. What are some of your favorite memories? Let me know down in the comments. And if you like content like this, please make sure you give this video a big thumbs up and that you're subscribed to this channel. And if you could, consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, Dave knows.